Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back. So this section will be a little shorter, um, and then we can have a nice discussion afterwards. I will endeavor to do my best to answer questions, or we will find a way for me to follow up questions like your synchrotron radiation one, because I'm trying to think of the best way to describe that still. So, uh, but anyway, uh, let's move into some hardware, right? Let's talk about 12 GeV CBAF. The Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility was founded in the 80s. And anyway, I'm not going to go like that the whole time. But um, I did want to mention that I stole some of these slides from one of my colleagues, Yves Roblanc, who is a senior staff scientist here. Uh, and if any of you are going to be working on this machine in the future, you will absolutely run into him at some point because he is one of the people that actually makes the machine work um, when it works. So. Uh, Let's go into this. Uh, quick overview. All right. So we all know where we're at. We are in Newport News, Virginia here. And there's the overhead view. We have A, B, C, and D up in the corner. You all got the tour. You know roughly what's going on, right? Uh, so we are a nuclear research facility. We do nuclear physics here. Uh, we also lead the world in SRF technology. Um, Again, we were the first major installation for SRF Linux in the world and still have arguably the largest SRF Institute in the world as well. Um, we also are very strong with polarized electrons and uh, our cryogenics and accelerator physics are top notch as well. Uh, you can see as well, annual operating budget. Now, some of these might be a little out of date. Again, I, I stole a couple slides from Eve, right? So, so apologies if the numbers are not spot on still, but there we are. So let's look at two different diagrams to best describe what is happening. You're all aware of this one. You went down there, you saw what's happening, right? Vertical. But if you kind of take those and smush them out sideways, right? It helps see what's happening with the beam a little bit better. So here we have the lowest energy arcs on the outside and the highest energy on the inside. Okay, that's just for ease of what is happening. And I have to use the laser pointer. We have our polarized gun here and the beam will come in through this chicane into the North Linac. Each Linac is just about 1.1 MeV per Linac or 1.1 GeV per Linac nominally uh, for any experimentalist in the room before you try to correct me. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, so we go through the spreader depending on the energy, right? Lowest energy goes the furthest up, highest energy down. Uh, Paul D, that's an extraction line, so that'll come later on. We recirculate up to five and a half times if you're going to D, five if you're going to these halls here. Um, BSY dump actually doesn't operate anymore, but um, more on that later. I'll talk about that in a second, or not in a second, but later on. We have our RF separation, which is kind of a cool way of separating the beam out. I mentioned during the break to a couple of people, timing is everything. Timing is really everything there. Um, so we all know that electrons, right? Uh, so let's go into it. Let's start with the injector. Now that you did not get to see on your tour, I am fairly confident because they are completely refurbishing that. So everything here, well, it was how it was, right? It's not actually like that as of like now, because uh, for example, they just replaced this quarter cryo module uh, and actually this bunch length cavity, uh, they're gone and they've replaced them with, you remember the UITF I mentioned earlier and how they cannibalized it? Well, that's where that cannibalized parts go, right? They they actually tested it in the UITF and then put the new cryo module there. This poor quarter cryo module has worked for 30 years plus. It had no problems. We're sending it off to a nice retirement. Most of the people in operations are crying a little bit, hoping that, you know, okay, hopefully the new one will work just as well as the old one, right? But we're confident. We're confident it'll work well, right? So that's all done. They also changed the gun. Uh, and I'll show some pictures. Yeah. Ah, uh, so, so yeah, that's a good question. But they, it'll help later with some of the other things. They changed the gun to a higher energy. And they, that way they're also, this bunch length cavity is now in the new cryo module. And so they have kind of clean things up a little bit and it's all being upgraded. So they're hoping it'll be a little more reliable and whatnot. Um, I, I'm confident in their abilities. Uh, so anyway, um, you can see some of the, the details here, right? Up to 90% polarized electrons and different components. I'm gonna walk through part of it, right? Um, so this is the old gun. Also 
from another angle up there. That's the old gun. This is the new one, uh, which is now actually installed. Uh, when I went down there, it was sitting on a push cart next to it. And well, you can see like the, the little portable clean room over the old gun. So they were getting ready to disassemble it when I was there. Uh, this was a couple months ago. Um, and now that's actually installed. But what happens, right? So let's let's go to the beginning. You see that little sign there. It's hard to tell on the screen, but it says laser on, right? The laser room is is there. They get four laser pulses for four hall operation. Boom, 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 boom. They come out and they hit a cathode and that sprays off electrons. And that happens in the gun. And then the electrons come out. They go through some optics, some uh, solenoids. Then they go through the weans and that gives them four pi control over the polarization. So they can really define how that electron beam is polarized up to about 90%. And then it moves downstream into the chopper. Um, so we get to the chopper. And uh, so, so again, the injector is coming this way here. And I actually got on the other side of the beam line. And so we have these two RF cavities and the chopper is actually in the middle there along with diagnostics. And so basically, <clears throat> they go through a bunch of cavity, goes through some diagnostics into the drop off. And then uh, interestingly, we have four experimental halls, but only three slits, because originally we didn't have hall D. And so how does the chopper work? This is inside of the chopper. One, two, three holes. Someone's going to have to share, right? So how does this work? It's a quick video uh, that Eve made in PowerPoint, but you can see the beams scooting around. Then it actually gets to a hole, and you can see it goes through. When it's not at a hole, it doesn't go through. And that's the idea. So you have two RF cavities and some lenses to actually cycle it through. Um, am I able to actually play that again? Let's see. There we go. I'll do it one more time just so everyone can see. So as the beam comes through, you can see that A and D are sharing a slit, right? And that'll come into play a little bit better when I show you how we extract the beam. But this is the idea is that you move the beam around and try to get them through those holes at specific times. Again, all about timing. So much of running an accelerator is about timing. Uh, depending on the accelerator, it can be really, really tight. Some light sources are femtosecond timescale timing matters. If you miss that timing, you miss, right? Uh, we are not that tight here, but but we are still pretty tight. Um, yeah. Uh, essentially, yeah, yeah, that's the... Yeah, so some of the beam will hit that that copper. It's very low energy, right? And so you don't have to worry too much about like spray. Or, I mean, it, it gets irradiated, but but yeah, we actually do have the little holes, and we we really do like hit at certain spots. Uh, we, we basically, it's kind of a continuous beam, so it's not like boop boop boop. It's kind of just painting out a circle, right? It's not fully continuous because it depends on the laser frequency, uh, which is also like five hundred hertz or four hundred ninety nine hertz each or megahertz each. Uh, I'll get into the that as well with the extraction part. But yeah, we basically go around that and get it through the holes. Uh, so after the chopper, we go through another buncher. You can see a tiny little buncher cavity here and then a small 500 keV cavity. So up the energy a bit. That is now gone. And you can see there the old quarter cryo module, all reliable. Thank you for your years of service. Uh, these are both gone now um, and replaced with a new quarter cryo module. Um, and then we go into the Linux, right? So you were down there, you saw what's happening in the Linux, right? Uh, so first off, I'm gonna describe this photo channel. So photo, focus, drift, defocus, drift. The O is a drift, not a, the D is defocus. Don't get, don't get it mixed up. So what does that mean, right? I described earlier quadrupoles, focus in one plane, defocus in the other. So one of the easiest ways is to make a, periodic channel, right? Where you say, okay, every 9.6 meters, we're going to have a cell and it's going to focus and defocus, right? So we have 9.6 meter cell where one point will focus, then you have a drift and you defocus, drift, then you have a new cell, blah, blah, blah. And that repeats. Uh, and so uh, you can see there's 418 SRF cavities in CBAF and there's three main types, C20, C20, 50 C 100s. There's also C 75, um, but they're in there as well, right? And so this is kind of the average uh, energies that you're getting for each one, right? And what kind they are. So you can see we've got a C 100 here, 
a bunch of C50s, a bunch of C20s, and then mostly our C100s are at the end of each Linac, right? We have, uh, I think this is, yeah, North Linac and South Linac. You could tell, little side note on our naming convention, right? The North is odd and the South is even. So there you go. So now if you see 1L or 3L, you know you're in the North Linac. And if you see 2L, 4L, whatever, you're in the South Linac. So now you can't get lost if you go down there, right? Um, so anyway, this is again the, the cavities and uh, this is the Linac that you all got to see. And let's go into the arcs and extraction. So in the arcs, I had mentioned the spreaders and the spreaders are very near and dear to me because I recently had to redesign them. So uh, this is the idea, right? We have a spreader and a recombiner which are supposed to be mirror symmetric to each other, right? So the beam comes in here, right? The last cry module ends about here. Uh, it's not in the picture. And then you have a, a last quad to kind of play with the optics before you go in. Then all five beams are coming in and the first one is lowest energy, gets kicked the easiest, right? Um, I actually, when I explain this to people that aren't graduate students, I'm going to describe it to you the same way for a second. I like to think of it as pressure coming at high pressure water coming out of a hose, right? The higher the pressure, the harder it is to bend. So if you want to stick your thumb over the end of that hose, the higher the pressure, the harder it is to actually change that direction, right? So that's, that's how I describe it to other people. And I'm just going to stick it out there in case you ever have to describe this to someone else, right? So uh, lowest energy gets bent easiest, gets kicked up. You'll notice that um, this is due to a redesign. Originally, this wasn't here and it cleared this, but instead they actually, uh, well, we can't fit that. So let's put a little hole through the, through the return yoke and we'll, we'll make it work, right? Like engineers are great. I love it. Um, and, and, and it's something I would not have thought of. I would have spent forever being like, oh, we know we have to miss them. No, 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 the engineer, no, just put a hole in it, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> so it's brilliant, it's brilliant. Um, and so, yeah, the first one there, second through fifth pass, I'll go through here. Then you can see second pass and third pass. And the other ones are going through another magnet. So Linac is here. This is a bit of another perspective coming through. You can see the other passes are here. And then, so you got one, two, three, four. So this is a septum magnet, which means part of it isn't showing field and part of it is. So they can squeeze it by. And then you have the higher passes down here going through. This is a nice diagram showing kind of what's happening, right? So first, second, third, fourth pass, fifth pass, right? And then we got to bring it back together because we need it to be achromatic, right? And so this is achromatic in one way. Uh, you see that there's two steps, one, two, right? Second little step, first big step. We do that also to make it achromatic. I told you about you know the dispersion and having to bring it back to zero. So you could do that by making things perfectly mirror symmetric, right? Because if you think of it like, like light optics, right? If you have one prism and then another prism to bring it back together, you're nice. You can also do it through this two-step method, which, so you come up, you bend it down flat again. There's a quadrupole here and a quadrupole here. Those two quadrupoles are used to kind of change the dispersion, right? So, so, and in the middle, you have a third quadrupole right there. Or in this one is one, two, three. And the middle one is at that zero crossing, right? So you have a negative dispersion, mathematically negative dispersion, right? It's, it's, it's not real. It's just mathematically negative dispersion. You use that quadrupole to kick it up the other way. Once you get to that zero crossing point, you stick another quad. That's to control your optics. And then you have that third quad to bring it back down again. And so it averages out so that by the end of this bend, you can actually get a zero net dispersion going into your spreader. But then you got to bend it back down again. So we're like, okay, let's just make that part mirror symmetric. Right, and then we don't have to worry about it. So we have mirror symmetric uh, spreader into the arc, recombiner back into the Linac. You have a question? Oh, um, radius is not something we, th so so we usually think of the beta, uh, which is, so the beta, not the V over C, because that would make it easy, but the beta being one of the twist parameters, which, so if you take the square root of beta times the emittance, you get your beam size basically, right? Um, now it's tiny. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Um, but it is, it is pretty small overall, except in here. So, uh, the fourth pass for some reason has a massive beta. Uh, now the beam is still going to be, you know, super, super tiny, but, uh, that's only because the emittance remains the same. The emittance stays the same throughout the machine. The normalized emittance stays the same throughout the machine. Um, nominally. Uh, so, but, but yeah, as far as like an actual measurement, like submillimeter, it's tiny, um, very tiny. Um, 
Okay, uh, so there we go. Quads, control, vertical. Okay, boom. And now we go into the recirculating arcs, right? Which everyone got to see at least part of. Um, I know they don't perfectly line up. That picture, the, the, the picture combination drives me a little nuts because I wanted them to go out of one into the other. I couldn't quite find two pictures that worked. It's close enough, right? Close enough for government work. So um, anyway, we're coming in. To, uh, actually, this picture is also important because you'll notice one, two, three, four, five. What's that, right? Ah, that six line, that's actually hall D. The hall D extraction line actually goes below all the other ones. And so I just wanted to point that out in this picture. It's an aside that's supposed to go in extraction later, but I wanted to show it now as well. So that also tells you which arc this is, right? Because if there's a hall D separate line, that means we're in the Northeast corner, right? Um, and then we are coming back around in this way. And so we have, I wanted to show the optics, right? We have a quadrupole and a dipole corrector. Dipole correctors, little dipole fields that change the trajectory, right? Um, so it's nice because we can design the perfect machine on paper and then it never really works out that way, right? It never actually gets what you want. So you got to stick extra things in there to make it work. And so correctors are one way to do that, right? You combine those with diagnostics, i.e. beam position monitors right there. And you can actually get a pretty good idea of what's going on. Let me describe a beam position monitor with my hands. So you get a can. Inside the can, you have either four, four pickups, let's call them antennas for now, right? Because they're different types. There's button or antenna or strip line, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. In the end, it's four pickups, right? And you could think of them like a cross, but then you want to rotate it because again, synchrotron radiation is going to be spitting stuff off, right? So you don't want to fry your electronics. So instead of having it in the plane of bend, you do 45 degrees. And so your antennas are on the corners like that. And then you have a moving charge, i.e. the beam, right? Electrons, they're moving, they're charge carriers. So what happens when you get a charge carrier going past a wire, right? Current, right. And so as this beam centroid goes through the pipe, I hope everyone can see, right? If it's closer to one or two of the pickups, those are gonna have a different current than the other ones. And then you do a difference over sums and you can kind of compare and see where that beam centroid is in the pipe. And then when you realize that it's about to touch the wall and you're gonna mess up the beam, you use your correctors to then kind of steer it back down. And the correctors are generally designed to do horizontal and vertical separately, right? So you have a vertical corrector and a horizontal corrector. You can use a pair of them to then kind of bring it back where it needs to be. That's the idea. Uh, again, nominally. How many? How do they work? So, so they they are electromagnetic dipole, elect, uh, electromagnetic dipoles. You change the current in them to change the strength, and so you vary. So they're they're kind of always on, right? And if you notice you're having a problem, you just change that current to either change it to kick more one way or you know less the other. So that's essentially it. Yep. Good question. Oh, yeah. So they have both systems. They have an automated feedback system, which will kind of keep your orbits nominally where they're supposed to be. At times, that can't keep up. Right. And so operators will be like, I'm going to change this and this corrector to bring it back. Um, there's also, for example, my my thesis dissertation forever ago was um, actually a diagnostic system, like a procedure where I would take two correctors and purposely vary them, uh, one horizontal, one vertical, and move that centroid around in an artificial ellipse. Right. I would purposely say, OK, wiggle the beam so that it paints out a specific pattern in at a specific point and then see how that progresses through the machine using the beam position monitors and then comparing where the beam is reading where the model says it's supposed to be we can say ah oh, therein lies a problem somewhere between this beam position monitor and this beam position monitor something's not working because it works here and it doesn't work here and you look at the optics you say, okay there's the problem so that that was you know forever ago it's called ray trace unfortunately named because everything is ray trace um i did not name it but anyway so, so, but that's the idea is you can, you can hand kind of crank them or you can have an automatic setup and they're working a lot as another aside. Um, there's a lot of like machine learning, AI, neural network stuff that's happening now to work on more automating this, right? So they have, they're, they've got decades of data here and they're trying to see how they can best combine that. And I'm not super involved. My student is actually involved with that for our new FFA arcs. Uh, Good on him, but <laughs> I do not have the computational chops to, to do very much of that. Um, now we're going to do extraction. 
so you can see where the extraction system is. Uh, of course, there's a separate extraction for, um, for hall D. So here we go, right? We have our spreader and our RF separators. The dog legs are to change the path length, right? Because this machine breathes, right? So, so it gets hot in Virginia during the summer, right? And while it doesn't get super cold, it, it, it ain't hot in the winter. And our machine actually changes length. And so we have these dog legs to then change that length back so that we can keep the timing. Because again, timing is everything. Because if you end up on a different spot, on that RF curve, you're not getting peak acceleration or maybe you're decelerating, right? And you're screwing up your bunches. So timing is everything on these accelerators. And so the dog legs actually help to uh, help counteract the machine's breathing. Even throughout the day, you can see a little bit, but we don't have to play with them that much. Uh, then we have what's the septa, these YA septa, YB septa, uh, diagnostic viewers. So a septa means you can go through the same dipole but it has like a separation in it. And part of the magnetic field will be one way and part will either be off or another way. And so um, basically these RF separators will provide a transverse RF kick to the beam at a specific time, kick the beam sideways or down, depending on which RF separator it is. And then once it is kicked, uh, it's only a little kick, right? Because RF can't kick very, very hard, which is why you'll notice there's one for the first pass or for the last pass, right? You need more of a kick. And so these provide that transverse kick to start the beam moving away towards the halls, or it doesn't kick and lets them recirculate. And as it goes towards the halls, it then goes through a septa because the change is minute, right? We're talking a couple centimeters, right? You can't even clear the magnet. So you put a septa in and that way, some of them recirculate and some of them just pass by and continue on towards the halls. That's the idea. And this is one of the tools that the operators can use to, to kind of see what's actually happening. Um, so here comes another video, right? So Eve put together slides. I made a little YouTube video about it um, because I couldn't, on Prezi, couldn't actually import animations. I figured out the hard way. So, so here's your video of what's happening with the extraction. Um, so your accelerator fundamental frequency is 1500 megahertz and the beam is going that way, right? We have each Hall has its own laser at 500 megahertz. It's actually 1497, 499, 499. Let's round, right? So we want some of the beam to go to the halls and some of it to be recirculated. So we go through an RF separator cavity at 500 megahertz. This is for the first four pass, by the way. So you turn it on and it'll kick timing wise, right? So you get that going through. Now for fifth pass, it's a little different. We also put each of these uh, passes on a slightly different part of the curve, right? So they're not all accelerating quite the same. They're close enough, right? So the halls don't see the difference, but we act, there is spacing on the RF wave so that we can differentiate where they're going. We can actually send each of them to a different hall at the same time. Um, that's for A, B, and C. Once we get D, right, we had that problem where, oh, how do we get D? We only have three slits. Well, this is how we solve that. We, not being me, but much smarter people than I am, right? So now we have a separate RF separator at 750 megahertz, half the fundamental frequency, right? And so we have the existing and then the 750, whoop, that kind of went really quick, didn't it? But so it's separating them out in this way, but then every other bucket goes to D, right? So if it's A and D that are sharing a slit, then every other one of those will be D and that can get sent to hall D. Was that... You want me to replay the video or are we good? I can replay it. Yeah? All right, I'll replay it one time. I know it kind of went a little quick at some parts and really slow at that middle part. So um, I'll work on improving that next time. But here we go again, right? So we have 1500 megahertz. All A, B, and C are each kicked at, or the, the laser for those is done at 500. So it's a third of the fundamental frequency. So that means we got three spots on that RF wave that the bunches of, uh, of electrons are going to be, right? And then we want to separate them. We use that RF separator cavity at a specific frequency to kick one of them, either for, or to kick it to the hall, right? And the rest will recirculate. So we can then, because there's three of them, we can say, okay, separate all of them towards the halls and then put A, B, C, right? With further separation because they're timed on the different part of the wave. Cool. So that's the essential for the fifth pass separation just there. And then hall D, ends that 
adds that other little element of like, okay, we got three holes and four beams. What do we do? So they came up with that 750 megahertz, which you'll see in a second, to give that extra little kick for every other bucket, right? We call them buckets uh, where it sits on the RF wave. So, so every other bucket of A, for example, might be a D beam instead. And that's the idea is that you can then turn it on at the 750 on top of the already present 500. And then you fill every, yeah, empty buckets. So you fill them with the hall D and that goes back around one extra pass through a Linac to hall D. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, yeah. So the chopper is at the beginning end and then this is at the other end, right? So it's like the beginning and the end has to work together perfectly timed to make it all kind of fit together. Timing is essential, right? Timing, can't stress that enough. Accelerators cannot function without really precise timing. So basically, yeah. It does. Um, it affects the current, but also it doesn't have to be A and D. You can do one of the other halls with D as well. Uh, and and But this all has to go into the planning of the experiments, right? So you have to say, ah, okay, I need this current. That hall needs that current. And D is operating. So we need to figure out how to share beam at the same time. It all goes into it. So, so I don't know. You probably talked to Doug Higginbotham at some point while you're here, right? Because he he's one of the people who talks to us accelerator folks and helps us all decide the schedule, right, of how we're going to operate. But a lot of that comes into like, okay, can we operate these two beams at the same time? Uh, no. So let's move that experiment to this time, this one here. And it has a lot to do with scheduling. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I think part of that came down to the current infrastructure was complicated and it would have involved a lot more expensive kind of upgrades and changes to the entire system, right? We had an entire system, again, timing based on three halls. And when they decided to do a fourth hall to change the entire infrastructure to be able to handle the four hall separation would have been way more expensive and, and costly, right? It, it is an unfortunate truth in a lot of what happens in science, right? Is that like, sometimes it's not the best decision. It's just the most feasible decision, right? Um, and, and there are consequences to it, right? There are like, sometimes we have something called bleed through, right? Where it's like, ah, we're getting some weird current happening where, for example, a little bit of the tail from the beam might be slipping through the wrong slit in the chopper, right? And all of a sudden it's like, ah, we're getting this extra current we didn't expect. And it's not being, you know, there are consequences to it, but there's a lot of very smart people that are like compensating for those problems, right? Uh, it's all a balancing. It, it's, yeah, it, it gets frustrating until you realize that there's a lot of smart people around to try to help the problem, right? So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it can be an issue. So, yeah. Um, so it's, the operators can do it relatively quickly. It takes a little time to set it up, but you just have to like basically say, oh, okay, we're going to stick it through this one instead and change the timing a little bit. And, but it's all like adjustments that the operators can do in, you know maybe an hour or two, something like that. It's not super bad. You basically, you could do it instantly, but then you have to check and make sure it's actually not screwing up. So that it's the checks that take longer. So, uh, and this is actually what they look like. Uh, so they do both vertical and horizontal separation. You can see on the right, halls A, B, and C, nicely separated on a viewer. That's, mm, that is pretty, that is really beautiful. And here you can actually see this is a viewer right before a septum, right? And so this comes in right before a septum. You can see three beams here. They're all collinear, which me makes you know that the operators are really on target this day. And then you have the dimmer one is just one beam going the opposite way, right? Um, and here we go. These are the RF cavities. These are the, R yeah. So they even label them for tours, RF separators. Um, and don't mind the plastic sheet. They were doing construction when I was down there, but these are them, right? So you can see one, two, 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 four. I don't know where the middle one is there, but yeah, you can see a couple more over here. So, so that's what they look like. Just wanted to show you. You probably, maybe, I don't know if you went into the, that. no, you didn't see those? Okay, so, so that's what they look like. Uh, continuing the tour today. Um, so, all right, and then boom, to the halls we go, right? After we separate, we can send them to the halls. So. I wanted to point this out real quick. This is the beginning of what's called the Lambertson magnet. Now the Lambertson is interesting because it actually has three beams coming through it at different heights, 
and different horizontal spreads. So it's hard to tell, but if you ever do get a chance to look at a diagram or anything, the coils on this are actually offset from each other in an interesting way. It's a really kind of complicated magnet that when you look at it, you're just like, that's another dipole until you actually go look at it. And you're like, oh no, like the coils are all funky and weird. And it's, it's a really kind of cool magnet. So after that, you can see the beams are not at the same height, right? So A, B, and C. And eventually we level them out, but so it's A, B, C. They're coming down towards the halls. We have A, B up the hill, and C. And after that, it's a black box because I'm not a nuclear physicist. And so everything that happens with the beam is a mystery to me. So, <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, I can't forget Hall D. We always forget Hall D. So Hall D, I showed you the beginning of that line. It comes through, this is, this is the hallway. This is the arc. This is actually coming up. If you look closely, um, they actually had to hollow out part of the cement floor, right? To, to make that dipole fit. Cause it's a, I think it's a four meter dipole. And to get that bend in enough, they actually had to like cut a little wedge out to, to make it fit right. And then, uh, oops, hang on. And then it goes up the hill and uh, well, that's an ODH one area. So on that day, I couldn't go up there and show you more of the beam line. So anyway, uh, that's Hall D and uh, that's the rough 12 GV. There's a lot of stuff I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about cryogenics, which we would not operate without. I did talk about timing, but I didn't talk about control system, which also is crucial and really important. There's so many auxiliaries that I could I can spend a week talking to you about each of these systems. So I just wanted to get into some of the real basics because that way I can start talking about what we're gonna do at 24 GeV. And it's not a very long talk because we're gonna probably chat quite a bit, but let's talk about what's gonna happen upgrading to 22 GeV. First off, why? Why do we want this, right? Well. Only got about a decade or so left of experiments planned at JLab, right? Roughly. And then we, you know, we're talking about a positron upgrade first. So we're going to send some positrons for a few years. And then after that, dot, 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 right? We don't know what's next. Uh, we didn't get EIC, as someone mentioned earlier. And so we need a future for the lab. And so what can we do? What can we address? And there's a lot of options. People are looking at bringing a light source here. People are looking at all these other things, bringing back their free electron laser, right? Um, <clears throat> but we're not sure. Uh, so, so what about increasing the energy, right? Well, we could do that, but it's expensive, right? If we wanted to upgrade our Linux with all these new cryo modules, right? And upgrade them, that's pricey. That, that's going to get like a big no-no from the government, right? Because we are government funded and it's all taxpayers. So thank you everybody for my paycheck, but it is, uh, <laughs> but, but it is government funded. And so we have to be careful about how we approach these things. We can't just be like, okay, upgrade everything to the newest, hottest cryo modules and really crank this out. Uh, it won't work that way. Also, um, if we really go heavy into this, it's not very green of us, right? We want to try to look at, being a little bit more responsible with how we upgrade these machines. So what if we can increase the number of passes on the Linux we have? That sounded reasonable, but you were all in the arcs. There's not a lot of space in there anymore, right? I mean, maybe we can encroach a little bit into the walkway, but then you can't get components in, right? Because I don't know if you saw some of the forklifts in there, but you bring a forklift down in the tunnel to carry those big magnets or, you know, the cry modules are actually put on wheels. But if you wanted those big dipole magnets on a forklift, you need space to be able to move it and turn it, right? So you can't encroach into the walkway too much more. We could start busting out into the cement, you know, and go out a little bit. That also gets expensive because I don't know if you know this, but we're built on the Yorktown formation, 30 feet down. Uh, the water table here is six feet. So our accelerator is underwater. So, I mean, that creates some problems as well, right? So, so how do we address this in a way that, you know, how do we get more passes? Well, um, I did mention FFAs earlier, right? Please remember, that's a screenshot of the slide, right? Let's talk about FFAs, multiple passes through the same arc, right? So let's look back at C-beta real quick. C-beta, based at Cornell University, co collaboration between Cornell and Brookhaven. They had this operating up until not so long ago. Uh, they, I think it was 2018, 2019, they did their full test, right? This was an ERL and an FFA. So they had what we call four passes up and four passes down, four passes accelerating to then power the four passes decelerating, right? And pull that power back out. But they did it with permanent magnets. So 
all of the arc and straight magnets are made of permanent magnets in that special design I was talking about earlier with the, the Hallbach magnets. They use electromagnets in the splitters. They had a single main linear cryo module plus their source cryo module and a beam stop. It only went up to about 150 MeV, right? But it was still four passes in the same arc. Uh, and oh yeah, it was not super high current either. And I put a link there. Um, hopefully it'll work. Uh, I'm not sure if the PDF was clickable. Anyway, you'll work that out. You can you can Google it as well. But I do recommend checking out some C beta because it's a really interesting project in and of itself. Can we use this though, right? They were 150 MeV. We're talking about going to 22 GeV, right? We want tens of GeV scale beam going through these permanent magnets. Can we do it? Can it fit in the current footprint of JLab where we don't have to bust out walls and everything? Well, I mean, we, we think so. We're still trying to figure it out. Uh, and that's that's what we're working on right now. So let's see, what is the current status, right? So this was just at IPAC, right? IPAC 23 in May, we just went. And this is one of the papers slash posters we presented. Uh, this is the current collaboration. We've been doing this for just over two years, right? So it's a good group of people from JLab, Brookhaven, Oak Ridge, and Cornell. Um, mainly it's JLabbers with three people from Brookhaven. A couple of people kind of filter in occasionally and help us out. But this is the main collaboration right now. It's led by Alex Bogach, um, and uh, Kirsten presented this at the at the conference. So this is her poster that she just presented, right? What is going on, right? Two years of progress. So let's talk about it. Uh, and then there's still a lot of work to do. Let's start off with a really basic, partially hand-drawn diagram of what we're talking about, right? Heads up, I didn't make this. Um, but so uh, you might be wondering, where's the injector, right? Because this is a nice block diagram. Well, it turns out, and I'll get into some of the more of this later, we're going to have to move the injector and upgrade it. I'll talk about that in a second. But you can see, right, recombiner North Linux spreader, e electromagnetic arcs, recombiner South Linux spreader, e electromagnetic arcs, same, same idea as before for the first four passes. And then after four passes, we're going to replace the highest energy, lowest physical arc with these FFA arcs uh, like that. So you can see this green and this green will no longer be those giant blue dipoles, but they'll be a series of permanent magnet, uh, permanent magnets set up in around in an FFA. So bending out, bending in, bending out, bending in, net bend all the way around the arc. Uh, I'll show you a bit more, but yeah, so, so how can we deal with that, right? It turns out if we wanna upgrade the energy and just do this, uh, that's going to mean that we start at the first part of this LINAC at 123 MeV, because that's the current injector energy, right? But then it's going to go up to like 22 and a half GeV. And that's a ratio of like one to 175. And we can't really control that kind of gap in beams, right? That's just too much. So uh, how do we change that? One thing you can do is inject at a higher energy. And we went through different iterations. We're like, okay, let's do a nice new greenfield kind of booster like up over here, right? And inject directly into South Linac at, you know, the the 1.1 GeV that would start, or, you know, that would start. We looked at that and then it's like, you know, building a little booster ring, that's pretty pricey, right? Uh, so, so they're like, no, come up with something else. We looked at upgrading the current injector, uh, not really a lot of space, right? It's kind of tight in there. Um, but you remember right around here, I mentioned we had that former free electron laser, right? Well, a lot of the components are still in there, again, acting as shelves, but they're in there. Uh, and that was an operating machine. And so why don't we look into making that into an injector, right? And then take that injector and inject it, not actually here, you just take a beam line all the way around into the North Linac at 650 MeV instead of 123. That brings that ratio down to about one to 33. We can manage that, right? We also had to update the optics in the Linac so you can see here, that's where the LERF is. If we inject out and around and actually into the North Linac. So for positron, this is dual purpose now. We can double down and get the positron upgrade at 123 still, but there'll be positrons instead. Once positrons stop, we upgrade that to 650 uh, by adding in another C75 cryo module. Uh, so at, at 123, there's two C75s and it'll recirculate around. Uh, and then at 
add another C75 cry module, we can get up to 650 after a couple rotations, inject into the Northland at 650, and then Bob's your uncle, we're good, right? And so this is what we think the energies will be, assuming six simultaneous passes in the FFA arcs. So 10 total passes. Originally, you'd stop here, right, on each one. Uh, the bold, which is kind of hard to see on the screen, so the first four on each is electromagnetic passes. They don't change very much, right? Uh, basically, they're 650 MeV higher than they were now. Uh, so right now, you know, it's it's an 1100, uh, you know, 1100 instead of uh, 1750. Uh, so, so they all scale up. And then we start getting the FFA and we go through and the ones in bold are what would be in the FFA lattices, right? That's the idea. Um, we also have to update the lattice uh, in the, the optics lattice in the Linux, right? So right now they're a photo, like I described, single quad for focus, single quad for defocus. There's other kind of fun ones. I'm not going to get into details during the talk. If you want to ask me about them, I can gladly talk about them, but you can, uh, you can actually take three quads together and make what's called a triplet, right? So you have focus, defocus, focus, or defocus, focus, defocus, depending on whatever plane you're in. And you can set those up in such a way that the lower energy passes, you know, because they're, the beam rigidity is a lot less, will feel those, those triplets a lot, right? And they'll get focused. Now, a triplet is generally properly designed, net focusing in both planes, right? So with a triplet, you can then really get tight control over the beam that's more likely to go wild, your low energy beam, right? It's always the little sibling. But um, so, so you get nice tight control of that, but it's still weak enough to where the higher passes basically view the LINAC as a drift, right? They're not feeling the magnetic a lot. And that actually works out really well because we can control what we call the beta functions, not the relativistic beta, but the essentially related to the size of the beam. We can control those on each end and match properly into the other sections. And it's almost the same for all the passes that way. Um, and so the LINAC optics was redesigned and the energy of the injector has been done. Then comes the spreaders, right? So I mentioned that these are very near and dear to my heart because I had to redesign them because think about going through that prism again, right? And all of a sudden your ratio is different. Right? You're no longer going in at 123 plus the 1100. Now you're going 650 plus 1100 in the next beam. So you have to change the ratio. Those, those are going to bend differently. Right, So we had to redesign them a bit. Full disclosure, there's a couple of tweaks that still have to happen, but we got reasonable optics. You can see, for example, there's a little bit of like those magnets are touching and they probably shouldn't be touching. Right, So, so there will be some tweaks moving on, but, but they have been redesigned enough for you know now uh this is just the hardware to re you know remind you what they look like now but that's not you know they look similar but basically this first what we call bcom dipole magnet we had to lengthen because it just couldn't handle the magnet strength right so we added a half a meter to that so instead of a one meter dipole is now a one and a half meter dipole then you got your integrated magnetic field and it's strong enough to bend everything as it needs to get bent right but the big change is we no longer have just five passes, right? So the first four, one, two, three, four, basically the same thing. But all the other ones are going to go through that FFA lattice. So we need to bring them back down into the same line, right? And so, again, how do you make something achromatic easily? Make it mirror symmetric, right? So the, all the beams got kicked up. Can't really separate them out because they're all coming in collinear here. They all go through that dipole. So no matter what, no matter how hard we try, they're all getting bent up. Even the high energy ones are getting bent a little. So how do we get them back collinear? We use a septum here. So that last fourth pass that goes to the regular arcs goes through like normal. And then we use another septum here to bring them back down. And this magnet and that magnet are basically the same. This one and that one are supposed to be the same. And this one and that one are supposed to be the same as far as field and length and integrated whatnot. So we could bring them all back down to be nice and collinear at Linac height again. And then we can move on to the FFA arc, almost. So before we get to that as well, let me tell you really quickly, one of the other problems we ran into is that it turns out we've upgraded this machine as, as Alberto said earlier, right? We were at four, then six, then 12. It turns out the magnets are kind of saturated now, right? They're, they're kind of wheezing, they're done, right? They can't go any stronger. 
And so uh, it turns out that that 1750 for these dipoles up here is just too much. We can't handle it, but these can handle it. And so what are we doing? We take all of these magnets and promote them, right? They all go up a level, keep the optics. Uh, and then that also gives us the space here to put that new FFAR, right? So we're reusing all of these magnets up a level. They're no longer saturated. They can easily handle the energy change. Um, you have to rematch a bit. You have to change a little bit of the details, but for the most part, you just scale for energy and promote them up a level. We're all good to go. And we're recycling all the magnets there for the first four passes. So, Hey, that's, that's financially stable, right? That's a good decision. Um, and so we've been working on putting everything together, right? So, so far we've put together all of the current upgraded electromagnetic. We haven't done all of the FFA part yet, but this this is beta for X and Y, right? And so you come in the North Lanac, it's really hard to see on this scale. You can't see it actually, because it looks like a line because it's it's all the machine, right? This is four passes. So this doesn't go to the 22 yet. This is just the first four passes. But you can see the Linux, right? How they scale. And you can see the optics and the arcs, right? There's that one monster in arc four, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Donish, who provided this, has since corrected that a bit, but we still get that big spike. It's just kind of nature of the beast. We could take advantage of it for diagnostics, though. Sometimes high dispersion areas are really good because you can stick a screen in and see what's happening with the beam. So let's let's paint that turd another color. Um, and yeah, so we can keep going. And we have the first four passes doing. He's also currently running some error analysis on it. Uh, the error analysis studies are ongoing. This might be interesting to some of you. This is how the Hallback magnets are designed. So Stephen Brooks from Brookhaven designs these. Um, it's a little hard to see, but you can see all these arrows are the fields, right? They're all going in different directions. And that aperture in the middle is the good field region um, here and here, right? So this is a bend and defocusing in the horizontal plane. This is bend and focusing in the hor uh, horizontal plane. So opposite in the other plane, right? And so, this is actually the C beta magnets. They're tiny. Um, you really can't tell. Uh, that's not, yeah, it's just over 10 centimeters, right? Uh, you can't see the grid uh, on the screen, but they're tiny. They're only, you know, let's let's say round up to 13 centimeter transversely. And they're about a little over a meter long each, right? So they're not very big, each one of them, right? And you stick them, oops, into a lattice around, right? So the radius of our arcs is 80.6 meters. That is the radius of the accelerator arcs, the recirculating ones in there presently. Stick them in a lattice so that they're alternating between these two, right? With a little bit of space in between. And I do mean a little, we're like 92% packing fraction or something like that, which brings me to a point that I'll maybe forget later, but we're not sure how we're going to fit all the diagnostics and pumps and stuff. And we're working on that part too, engineers to the rescue. Um, but this is actually the C beta arc. Now you you might be curious, okay, these are actually cooling, right? And you might be wondering, why are those coils on there? There's coils, it's supposed to be permanent. Mag well, they're also correctors, right? So, so instead of putting correctors in between everything, you take, uh, so corrector coils and corrector magnets are a lot lower energy. So you don't need the massive power supplies you need for our big dipoles, right? So you can get a bunch of small power supplies to then power these quadrupole with dipole moment Correctors are called Panofsky magnets. Uh, you put them over the permanent magnets, and then you can get minor adjustments in the focusing and dipole fields, as well as if you're very clever, higher moments as well, right? And so that is actually how C beta did it. They wrapped their permanent magnets in these Panofsky quadrupoles to then correct the fields. Another point that I wanted to raise, we kept talking about synchrotron radiation, that will fry magnets, right? But Stephen thought of this because again, C beta was 150 MeV at highest energy. 150 MeV isn't even our injector, right? That's tiny here, but he designed them with an open plane, right? You notice the open mid plane in each where there's no magnet. That's, that's basically so that the synchrotron radiation can go out and reduce striking your permanent magnet material and demagnetizing it. So it was a clever way to think ahead. Um, we're also simulating these pretty heavily and again, some of these lines aren't showing up very well, but this is six different passes. You can see each one kind of wiggling as you'd expect, right? I mentioned that they all wiggle as they go through. Uh, he's So Alex Cox is, our, is my PhD student and he's going through doing uh, 
starting really heavy statistics ones. These are low statistics studies, just basic ones to see how they're going. He's getting on a farm right now. He's actually applying neural network algorithm to then find a correction scheme, right? So we introduce all these different problems, right? We have survey offsets, we have tilts and pitch and yaw and yawns and whatever else, right? All these problems that go into these magnets, uh, field, mag uh, field problems and everything. And he's kind of randomly distributing them and seeing how we can best correct them with those Panofsky quads I was mentioning. And it turns out that's really big parameter space. And so sometimes a really big parameter space use a really good computational tool. So he's currently going through that process and trying to figure out the best tool for the job and then the best way to actually correct these. Because also in the current electromagnetic arcs, right? You have those little dipole correctors I mentioned. And if you see a problem, it's easy. You just kick it. But there's six beams in this one, not one. So if you kick one beam, you're kicking all of them. So you can't just kick at one location. You have to be clever and distribute these kicks in a way that doesn't impact all of your other beams that maybe you're behaving properly, right? And so that's also what he's looking into. Uh, he's, a, he's a busy guy. Um, so not bad for two years of work, right? You're doing okay. Uh, there are some challenges left, to put it mildly, and I'm only going to go into some of the major ones. Currently, the highest priority challenges are the splitter, the FFA transition, uh, extraction, right? Because all the people working on this are accelerator people. And to us, the accelerator is the exciting part. And the, the experiment is the black box, like I said. And so it took us a while to be like, oh, wait, we need to get the beam out, right? So working on that, working on that. And uh, and of course, the new injection line, um, which is hand-drawn. No, um, it's, it's actually making progress. But uh, so I'll start off with the bane of my current existence, uh, the splitters, right? So the splitters, this is how C-beta did it. Now, this is actually a photo of theirs at 150 MeV again, right? So these are like baby magnets, right? They're tiny. They're, you know, they come out and you can see the beam comes this way, goes through a dipole, separates out, and then they separate them all out into four different chicanes so that they can adjust half length, R56, which is a matrix term that has to do with momentum compaction, uh, optics and orbits before they actually get into the FFA arc because again, our machine breathes, but also each of these passes, even though they're all in the same beam line, they're all taking slightly different paths in those magnets, which means they're traveling a slightly different length, right? Which means they're not gonna arrive at the right time on that RF wave. So we have to make sure that all of those six passes have an integer wavelength difference as they go through so that they're all landing at the right spot on that RF wave when they get back to the LINAC. So we have to do these in the splitters. It's the only way to do it because, well, we don't have the control of the electromagnetic arcs. So this here is probably about three-ish meters apart for their 150 MeV version at C-beta. It turns out um, that's the only space we have too, is about three meters, just shy of three meters of space that we're allowed to use for this. So the beam comes in at center. This is the wall, that orange line, Right. And then I went to environmental safety and health and I'm like, hey, what is the personnel clearance requirement at Jefferson Lab? And it turns out it's 44 inches. Right. So uh, I had to basically go to I went in the tunnel and I measured a bunch of places. I had engineering drawings and I was like, OK, beamline center to the walkway wall minus 44 inches gives me this line. Right. So this the wall to the walkway distance is just shy. Two point nine four meters or something like that, right? Not a lot of space. Again, 150 MeV, uh, 10 and a half to 22 and a half GeV, right? Need bigger magnets. All these magnets, so, so look at the scale real quick, right? First off, also you'll see it's taking almost 90 meters up. This is just about three meters. It's, it's, uh, they're all rectangular magnets for now. The big blobs are three meter magnets and the short ones are a meter and a half magnets, right? So I have three meter dipole magnets trying to fit into a space that's less than three meters this way. So I have to be very clever about how these fit. And we need to do it for six passes. If this was one or two or three passes, they fit, right? I basically just come down and do a little chicane, right? Like whoop, just a chicane, we're good. Change your path length, put in your optics, you're good. Six is another issue, right? And so this is actually, I took the screenshot yesterday, the day before, like this is this is where I currently am. I'm working on the geometry, right? There's no quads in there yet. 
There's no optics yet. It's not quite closed yet because I got to close it about here. Uh, but I'm starting to try to close them all together and make them all achromatic and pretty and fitting in the box, right? Got to fit the pieces in the box first. Then I have to go back in and add uh, at least eight quadrupoles because you want a quadrupole per variable, basically, right? And we have seven variables we need to match for. So I want eight quads because one having having a little bit of redundancy is always good. Uh, then also the extraction, we're like, oh, where can we actually get each of these passes out? It turns out this is the only place that these FFA passes are separate, are in the splitter. So I'm like, okay, we need about a three meter dipole, C-shaped dipole. So instead of like nice square, you get the coils kind of bare. You just turn them off. And when you want to extract, you turn it on, bend it down. So this is the current thinking is extract one here. I don't have them labeled. So put one here, one here, uh, one here, one here, and one here. And that way we can steer them down because this is at linac height. So we get a little bit of space underneath. And we can do beam lines underneath and bring it to the extraction, right? To be determined. But that's the status, right? I'm being honest. I'm giving you the current status. That, that is where we're thinking for extraction. Uh, and so, yeah, this is a work in progress, but we're getting there. Uh, it would be very much easier if we decided to do five passes instead of six. That will drop the total energy down to, you know, about 20 instead of 22. But it'll give a lot more flexibility to the users as far as uh, what beams they can get. Uh, because, for example, real operations of a machine, sometimes cryo module drops down. Sometimes you don't get the full energy out that you're expecting to get. Usually. And, and so you need to have a little bit of extra flexibility in there to kind of play with the errors. And um, as you can see, this is really tight. I'm interleaving these magnets. Um, and yes, there will be fringe fields playing with each other, which is another fun part of this. So um, they're really crammed in. But if I were to get rid of that, um, this whole set of beam lines would actually kind of start here. And I'd be able to basically just do a bunch of chicanes and we'd have a lot more flexibility, but it depends on what the users want. If they want 22 GeV, this is it. If they want 20 GeV, but more flexibility, we drop a line. Anyway, current baseline is six, and I have to prove that I can't do it before um, we drop it down. That's the splitter. Uh, we also have that transition, right? So on the other end of the FFA arc, we could put another splitter, which would actually give us a lot more flexibility. Problem is, again, access. There's two spots in the lab in the nor uh, northwest and, sorry, northwest and southwest corners are the only accessible parts of the LINAC to bring cranes in and whatnot, all your heavy equipment. So if we had these splitters in all four corners, then we would have to put false floors in and all this heavy equipment would have to go over the false floors. And it's kind of a hassle, right? So we're thinking if we can do two splitters on each corner, right? One in the Northeast, one in the Southwest. Yeah, I said that right. Um, and then uh, do these transitions to bring the FFA lattices back into the LINAC. That might be the best way forward. So that's our current baseline thinking is, okay, let's get these four passes back together before the LINAC, right? Also a work in progress. It's hard because there's not just bringing them back together. You have to get the optics to match and the timing Timing again to match. Everything has to be right. Um, and then, of course, there's that Lerf to North Linac line. And this is currently being done by Yves Roblant and Dennis Turner. Uh, you can see, right, it's, well, it's almost a kilometer long line because it's coming from that Lerf going around the South Linac and then around the Arc and then into the North Linac. So we got, you know, just shy of a kilometer long beam line, uh, but is making progress. It actually also has a vertical change as well. So it's coming from ground height down to LINAC height, or sorry, down to the top, right? They're going to actually hang it along the ceiling in the uh, tunnel. Uh, so if the LINAC is here, right? You all in there, picture me in the tunnel, right? LINAC here, beams going that way. Into the walkway, along the ceiling in the corner is where they're going to hang this beam line, right? So it's actually going from ground height to top of the tunnel height, and then down to Linac height on the other one. So it's 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 a wonderful piece of uh, design. It's just complicated. So that is in progress as well. And uh, we go from here, right? So I'm currently managing a laboratory directed research and development grant for start to end simulations. Uh, so 
that is wrapping up at the end of this fiscal year, so end of September. Um, so you saw the fruits of some of that. Donish had done all the electromagnetic arcs and, and whatnot. He's currently putting the rest of the machine together with the exception of the missing design elements. Luckily, they're in the code. We can put what's called a match element, which lets us put in like a kind of a dummy for now. Like, okay, this will, you know, match here, match here. It's a matrix basically. And, uh, and then later on, we can then plug in the real design when it's there. So he can do the rest of the machine anyway. Um, also applying for a new one so that we can actually test some of these materials. Because I had mentioned you zap permanent magnets with radiation and they don't behave the same forever, right? And uh, if we're going to do this multi-million dollar upgrade to the lab, let's make sure we're choosing the right magnetic material and make sure we don't have to change them every, you know, five years or something like that. So uh, we're, we're looking into getting magnetic material samples and some spares from C-beta and whatnot, and then irradiating them, right? Zapping, it, it's, it's kind of fun. I just get to stick magnets in there and zap them with radiation and measure them before and after. So that's the idea for that. Um, and we're gonna continue refining our design and that is uh, where we're at for now. So discussion? <laughs> so this is a, a bit of a chicken and egg problem right because there's always the balance of cost versus future cost right and and hopefully i'm not going to get in trouble for saying stuff like this right but some of this gets into politics as well right where and i'm not going to say anything specific but um sometimes funding is easier to get than others for the sciences. And it very much depends on what the current political thinking is as far as do I care about cost over decades or do I care about cost over five years or four years or whatever, right? And so part of that comes into play. Jefferson Lab, when it was originally designed, actually left some space at the end of their Linux for later upgrades. I've heard both sides like, oh, it was by accident. And some people say, no, it was on purpose for future upgrades. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and say like, oh no, they knew that they wanted to upgrade later. So they'll have space for more cry modules, right? Let's, let's pretend that that's the truth. Um, I'm not sure if it is or not, honestly, but it is a smart thing to think of, which is another reason why, for example, the linear colliders I was mentioned, one of their main selling points is that like, we can start at low energy for cheap and then just keep getting bigger as we need more energy, right? That is a selling point for them, but you know, six of one, half dozen of another, right? So yeah, complicated answer, I think, for a complicated question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So C100s are uh, very expensive to make. Um, now you could arguably do that, but then you still run into some of the problem we had where we'd have to then replace all of the electromagnetic arcs right? Because then it would be a much higher energy, right? So that, that would be a, a very physics wise and engineering wise, that would be totally doable, but it just gets really expensive that way. Right? So if you put, and so yeah, it's a hundred MeV per cry module, right? Or per cavity. And so that's what the C100 is. Right. And then, um, if you did all C100s, yeah, we could up our energy. Right. Um, but you'd have all the other problems of like, okay, then you have to change the spreaders and arcs and every magnet would have to be changed and it would just be significant. But this way we're able to maintain what we have and, and maybe minor upgrades to them, but keep most of the infrastructure and do it much more cheaply this way. So, yeah. What is the actual downtime to do that? As well as that? So this is a very hand wavy answer I'm gonna give you because we're not sure yet, but the time scale on this, you know, we got about a decade uh, then we got a couple of years down to do positrons, then three years ish up for positrons, and then a long down to do this. So this is kind of the 20 ish year times 19, 20 years before this is like working. Right. So, so I'll be just about retirement age, you know, when, when it's all the, you know, so, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, none of these are quick time scale things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's assuming everything progresses nicely and everything it, it, uh, a lot of these machines take a very long time to actually put together, especially because we want to maintain operation as long as we can, right? So during the 12 GeV upgrade, they tried to do work around the machine, right, to prep until it was down, and then they could come in and boom, right? 
So it's all about like trying to yeah, timing, right? Timing. I should have just called this talk timing, but um, anyway. Questions, okay. comments, concerns, jokes. Otherwise, I'm sorry. And I would like also to thank Brian a lot. This was mm. entertaining, and one 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 big thing was that he got the theories talk about accelerator physics. I mm. you during the break and so so. Oh. <laughs> thank you again. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. It was great. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you.